Hey, it's Dave Dolphin at practicalworshiplog.com, and there is a YouTube channel called Hey Worship Leader that you should check out. A guy named Jimmy Cooper is the guy that runs it, and really good for worship leaders. Pretty similar to what happens here at uh, Practical Worship in terms of videos that help worship leaders be the best at what they do, and just honing their craft in terms of uh, leading a band and leading worship on Sundays. But there's a little bit of a guitar bent on his channel. Lots of videos have to do about specific guitar pedals and tone and different guitars and things like that and we've had a lot of conversations on the phone super awesome dude and he said he was gonna do this and he made a video where he actually reacted to a video that I created several years ago where I gave a tour of our guitar position at a church that I used to be at. Now, if you know what video I'm talking about, you know that there's a lot of controversy that goes around with this video. If you, if you haven't seen it, you will very soon, I'm, I have no doubt that this is going to come up in his, in his video. And so I thought it would be kind of fun since he reacted to my video, I'm gonna react to Jimmy reacting to my video on our guitar position, kind of maybe a reaction inception kind of a deal. So let's have some fun with this. Hey worship leader, welcome back to the channel. All right, today we're gonna to be doing something a little bit different. There's a specific video on a friend of mine's YouTube channel that seems to be getting a lot of heat, a lot of negative comments, a lot of dislikes, and it's all centered around pedal boards for worship. Now, if you've been around the channel at all, you know that I'm- You're not wrong. <laughs> pedal board. I hear your guitar music, your like heavy rock music, I hear you. If we've never met, my name is Jimmy Cooper and I created Hey Worship Leader to be a resource. I started this channel to help worship leaders. We talk about how to pastor your people, how to lead your teams well, and we also talk about gear. If you are new here and you like this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing to the channel. I look at my you should subscribe. all the time and it says that like he roasts 70 me. to 80% of the viewers of this channel are not subscribed. So if that's you, please hit the subscribe button. you should still subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you can be updated when new videos come out. I'm putting out like two videos a week so you don't wanna miss any of that. But right now, I need to find out what is so wrong with this particular video over on the channel called Practical Worship by my friend Dave Dolphin. I've never seen this video, this is a true reaction video, but I have read through some of the comments and boy is there some heat over there. There are a few supportive people over there, but there are a lot of people hating on this video. So like I said, this is a true reaction video. We're gonna watch it together, we'll pause it, talk about it, comment, and I want you to do the same thing. All right, we're all set up, here we go. The title of the video is A Tour of Our Church Electric Guitar Setup. Sounds easy enough. Let's do it. Hey, it's Dave Dolphin at practicalworshiplog.com sharing ideas, tips, and practical advice for the everyday worship leader today. Man, good intro, Dave. Yes, we know exactly what we're going to be getting into. Funny thing about the intro, by the way, is I, because when I started doing this, like I did it by accident in one video and I liked it. And then I spent like the next six months trying to figure out what I did. You could even see like I kind of almost like thrust it. Like, like you are going to get these tips. I eventually figured it out. Um, but anyway, this was definitely in that little six months period of like, what did I do with my fingers? Anyway, giving you a tour of our electric guitar position here at the church. Now, one of the things I should probably mention up front is that we provide all the back line for the instrument positions here at the church. So that's pretty common to maybe have a drum set that you have all of the drummers use. Um, it might actually be pretty common to have a church keyboard that all the keyboard players use. But when it, when it comes to the electric guitar player position, it's pretty unusual to say, hey, we own the pedals and we own the amp and we want you to play that. But we do that for three reasons. One of Okay, let's stop right there. So, did you hear what he said? They provide drums, which I think is pretty normal, provide a keyboard, but they also provide the backline amps and the pedal board for their worship ministry. Hmm. What do you think about that? Let me know down. You know comments. exactly what I they think front, about I that. So as a worship leader, provide those things. We provide the drum set. We have a church bass if they want to use it. We have the keyboard. And not long ago, I actually made a video showing you our church pedal board. We also provide a church pedal board. Let's hear what he has to say. Problem being consistency. We can swap out different players weekend to weekend and still maintain the same sound because we have the same gear. Now I know different players are going to bring different nuances, different techniques 
to the instrument, just like uh, uh, different drummers are going to play the same drum kit differently, and it's going to have different nuances. But by and large, having the same gear here allows us to have a consistent sound from weekend to weekend. Number two hmm. uh, being that it does eliminate the time wasters, uh, at least a lot of them, when it comes to rehearsal. You're not, you know, if you're bringing in um, different gear and different pedals and amps and things like that every single weekend, you know, it eliminates the spending 30 minutes trying to figure out where a hum is coming from, only to find out that some boutique pedal that a guy got in a different country doesn't like the lights. It's happened. Hmm. Number three is that it opens up uh, possibilities for younger players, maybe those in your student ministry, youth ministry, even adults who don't necessarily have the budget for pro gear, but they have the chops. You provide an avenue that they can play and you're not strapped to their budget. They still have access to pro gear, uh, even if they can't afford it. Okay, let's, let's talk about it. Three things, he gave three very clear reasons of why they do this. Let's process it. The first one was consistency. So it sounds like if you play at this church, you're gonna be playing through this board. I gotta wrap my head around that for a second. So he compared it to the fact that a drummer is gonna be unique even on the same kit because he plays a little differently. Same is true with the guitar player. They're gonna be have unique sounds uh, based on how they play even through the same setup. The thing about the electric guitar roll that I know is that people's pedal choices and guitar pickup choices that's all like nuanced stuff that is usually connected to them as an individual yes and and that's what i've learned this video is four years old and i you know and i got this idea from church on the move up in tulsa because they do this they actually i mean all of the equipment is provided down to the guitars like you everything that they have but you also have people that have like toured with Third Day and Everclear and Point of Grace, if you want to throw that in the mix. I mean, you've got some pros and they also have really healthy budgets that you know that the gear, like the stuff is going to be top of the line. Um, the board that we put together was good, but we knew that it wasn't amazingly awesome. But we wanted to be good enough where a good player would would look at that and say, okay, I can make that work. But in the last four years, what I have learned is that although I think my argument is still, I still subscribe to it wholeheartedly that as an, I guess maybe because I am a drummer, I sold my drum kit like years ago because every place I would play, they wanted you to use their drum kit. Now you might be able to bring in your own snare, or your own cymbals to kind of give your nuance or your, your flavor, but a lot of times not that's not even the case. I feel like I can still make that same argument and I'll do it all day, but what I have learned is that for better or for worse, guitar players really are connected to the gear that they are. And, and so I've, I've made changes. I might talk about that later, but let's watch some more push back on that point yeah maybe but I also get it consistency of sound because he said you know things have happened and I think things that was happened. point two right he said it eliminates the uh, time it wastes to try to figure out a noisy part of a signal chain which I get that as well okay so here's the signal chain let's see this board our vision for this was that we wanted something that was simple enough that if you weren't familiar with it, you could start playing with it and get up and running. Because you're not familiar with it because not be, uh, swimming it's on your board. Pedals and whatnot. But it needed to be complex enough that it had all the tools and textures and tones and things you would need to play our style of music. And Before we keep going, let me go down to the comments real quick and just read some of this stuff. Like we already see this video has <laughs> this is gonna be bad. likes. I have not liked or disliked yet. We will wait and see. By the way, I, I'm not sure where it falls in terms of the, the number of likes, like my top likes, I think it's in like the top five, top 10. Um, but it also, it is definitely the number one disliked video uh, on my channel, which is, which is fine. I mean, opinions are good. 196 dislikes, that's, that's a good bit, but it's, it's, it's got a lot, lot of views and a lot of people dislike stuff just because it's amazing. I never dislike a video, but that's just me. Only true guitarists will dislike this video. I don't know if I'm a true guitarist or not. That is a sad board. <laughs> well, we're about to find out. Um, I like the idea of having a pedal board for someone who doesn't have their own. Yeah, me too. Uh, let's see, micromanage much? <laughs> so I get that a lot. Passive aggressive, okay. This is the saddest video I've ever watched. <laughs> I would certainly never play guitar at that church. Wow, we have some very strong opinions. Andrew yes. Brown, that's a great way to destroy creativity. Dave, you are a destroyer of creativity. I'm habits. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, 
I'm sorry. Surely musicians should have the encouragement to be the individual they were created to be. Sure, have the gear there for those who can't afford it, but the command to use what is provided for you is insane. You are now commanded to use this gear. I mean, I get it, maybe. Josh, gross, just gross. And 11 people like that comment. I feel like Jimmy is, because we're friends and because, um, you know, we, we've talked whatever, I feel like he's, he's kind of letting me off easy. I, I wonder, I wonder if there's like an unfiltered, like, I think he's being gracious uh, and I think, and, he, and he's being nice. I'm wondering though, if he's holding back just a little bit and it's okay. Like, you know, I've, I've learned a lot of things. I actually had a good conversation, a podcast conversation with Brian Wall, who does worship tutorials. And I, on the podcast, I asked him this question, like, what would you do? And he said, you know, I would, I get it, I understand it. Um, I would do it. And then I would send you a worship tutorial video and say, do you want to sound like this? And uh, I get it, it's cool. When we were putting this together, uh, we enlisted the help of our current players and they got to, to speak into this quite a bit because Okay, so that's the next thing I was wondering. They got the electric guitar players at their church having input on what goes on this board. That's definitely a plus. If you're gonna ask someone. It needs to be. I mean, uh, and, and even kind of back to the micromanaging thing, it's, um, you know, f the need for like consistency and, you know, can just control the sound like a producer would. If I, if I didn't enlist the help of not only our players, but, you know, some really good players around the city, uh, I don't know guitar. Uh, I mean, I know what I like, I know my sound, but I don't play it every single day like these guys do. And you're gonna make them use something. Same thing with drums. If you're gonna play a particular drum set, especially if you're kind of like the, the main guy, you might have like two or three, but if you're like a main person, wouldn't it make sense that that person would speak into it and that you would you would gain from that, from that wisdom, so. Play, uh, you know, gear that's not their own, especially a guitar player, we wanted to make sure that they had input and, uh, we're able to speak into the decisions. This is the Ernie Ball volume pedal, and we do start with that first for no other reason than it's just easier to get to that jack um, as far as plugging your guitar in. And we mainly use the volume pedal for like swells and stuff like that, so it works fine for us. Okay, pause. Cool, they have the Ernie Ball volume pedal. They put it at the front of the chain mainly for just because it's easy to get the jack there. Uh, if you're into pedal boards at all, you may know that a lot of people, a lot of guitar players don't like the volume pedal coming first. They like to put their volume pedal after their compression and overdrive. In and I'm one of those people, but back to my earlier point, the main player that we had at the church, he liked it that way. And so that was a decision that he got to make as far as hey, if you're going to play this and if you're the main player and you want it in a different order makes sense and if you're using that for like swells and things like that then like if you know how to run it then that's okay but that's but that's why it's where it's at is because the main guy wanted it that way in their signal chain because when you pull back on the volume pedal in front of an overdrive it actually takes away the gain of that overdrive where if you keep the volume pedal after your overdrives it retains the gain and the tone and you're just bringing down the volume so it is just a preference thing but yeah if you're showing up and you're not used to it, you might be thinking, oh, that's not how I would run it. But anyways, that's how this board is run. We'll see what's next. Uh, that goes into the... I see they got the uh, Altoids little tin there, of course. Definitely going to have that, but this one's the cinnamon. Of course you do. Little, little cinnamon smalls. Okay, Dynacomp MXR. Compressor. Uh, the MXR compressor, and then that goes into the Polytune. Again, the reason the tuner... All good stuff. Compressor. It's a decent compressor. I've never run it. I've heard good things about it. I've seen it on a million boards. So tried, tested, and wow. true. I'm sure there's better ones out there, but for a church board, good to go. Polytune, great tuner. Uh, after the Polytune, uh, we go to our two drives here. Uh, the main drive we use is the Voodoo Lab Sparkle Drive, and I love how this sounds. There's just there's nothing else like it, and I, I really still do love like how it sounds. Pretty pretty drive. Uh, but we also have this booster here, this EP booster. And so um, this gives it a little bit of a crunch that gives us a, a lot more crunch. And then together um, gives us uh, a lot of crunch. So it gives you three levels of drive. So we got the tuner, we got all that stuff, sparkle drive. I've never had either any of these pedals so far, but I've seen these pedals on a lot of boards. So the same thing, tried, tested and true. I like how they have the boost going into the overdrive. That's how my overdrive is set up. I have my overdrive, but then you can click on a boost and boost that overdriven signal to get even more overdrive. You can do them independently or together. So he's got three different sounds. That's a good way to set it up. I like that. 
Now that goes into this M9 here that we are using strictly for uh, delays what was and that reverbs. Face? And the way we had this set up. I don't know if that was a good face or a bad face. That was a that was a lot of emotion face. I, I guess we'll find out. Okay, we'll stop it right there. I've never played through any of the Line 6 stuff before the HX Stomp. The HX Stomp was my first Line 6 experience. I love it, and so, um, yeah, I don't know this piece of gear, so if I were showing, I'm putting myself in a volunteer shoot. If I were showing up at this church and I had to use this, I hope that I would enjoy these sounds. Hopefully they've been dialed in by the guitar players there that know what they're doing, and maybe I could get used to it, but, I mean, the delays on yeah, there but I under long. but I understand. I understand that, you know, you would hope, but you, you wouldn't know. I get it. Is it easy to adjust? I'm sure it is, but as someone who's never played through this unit, and here's my biggest thing, if this board stays at the church, how am I supposed to get used to it? Am I supposed to show up to rehearsal and then get used to this piece of gear? Or I'm just not supposed to touch it and just go with it? That's a really good question. Uh, and that comes up a lot in comments and that, it makes a lot of sense. We never really had um, a need for that. Although if someone were to ask me, hey, can I take this home? I, I would 1000%. I mean, yeah, you, you, you want to go home and practice and learn and be better at what you do and bring that back. So Sunday morning's better. Of course, we're going to do that. But that's a really good, a really good point and has kind of influenced future decisions. We'll get to that. But I want to, I want to see what he has to say first before I kind of give my closing argument. Was there a tap tuner on here? Maybe the hold for loop. Oh yeah, there's the tap down there. So you could tap it in. I guess they've already oh, kind of figured Oh, out. I'm about ready to rock your world, Jimmy. I'm about to rock your world. Maybe. Different songs call for different lengths of delays. Even if they're mm -hmm. tapped out right, the parts might be different. You know, if you're playing a lot of single note stuff, you want the repeats on that delay to maybe be longer, where if you got a lot of notes, you don't want the repeats to be in so long. So you, that would be something you need to adjust maybe from week to week, but then another volunteer comes in the next week and they might, might just be different. So. Hmm, I don't know, let's keep going. And the cool thing about this is that, uh, and this, if, if I have a player that I tell them, hey, I want you to come play, but you have to use our gear and they're, they're not sure about it. When I tell them this one thing, this usually seals the deal. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Um, this right here is a MIDI cable that comes from our Ableton Live rig. We run tracks, okay. which means the songs have set tempos and that MIDI cable is setting the, the tempos for the delays. And so you can tap if you want to, but you huh? don't have to, they're huh? automatically set. And when the new song comes on in the, in, you know, in the series of songs you're doing, it resets the, the tempos for the delays and you never have to tap them, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now it doesn't it doesn't account for the the length of the delay, how many repeats there are, but the fact that whoever's controlling Ableton, whether it's the drummer or keyboard player, as soon as they switch to the next song, all of your um, BPMs in this unit automatically change. Yeah, that's that's pretty sweet. The final stop on the board is uh, this radial SGI box. Yeah, these are nice because if you were to just run your instrument cable all the way back there, the 40 feet, if you even had one that long, uh, you would lose a lot of tone. So this helps you not lose so much tone on long runs. They're fantastic. That th seems like they thought of everything. I mean, I, I wouldn't have too much to complain about except showing up and maybe not knowing the gear. Mm -hmm. All right, we got a few minutes Ballot left. Point. Let's see what else they talk about. All right, next stop is the amp. Let's go check that out. Oh, yeah, the amp. Nice backstage. Some boxes. So backstage is where we keep the electric guitar amp, and here's the other uh, SGI box that receives uh, this microphone signal. Uh, this is the AC-15, uh, it's a C1, it is a tube amp, it's not solid state. We have not done any mods to it. Uh, we haven't uh, changed out the speakers or anything like that. This is pretty much fresh out of the box. I mean, the fact that they're providing really good gear uh, is, is great. You know, if you were being forced to play something that was just cheaply done. Yeah, that, and that was the goal, was that, you know, I knew you know, when you start, when you say, hey, play this, especially if you want a quality sound, like, but even then, like, you just, you know, you want, you want the experience to be enjoyable for the player. And if they don't enjoy it, then they're not going to want to play and recruitment becomes harder and all that. So we knew that if we were going to make this, if we were going to put this flag in the, in the sand, it had to be the very best that we could afford. 
and you could certainly get better and also understand like like of the M9 this is 4 years old at the time M9 when it came to like reverbs and delays was really good we didn't use it for drive because the drives and all that it didn't really sound all that great um which is why we actually use like actual pedals for drive and things like that but you know we wanted the very best that we could uh, out, you know, afford. And this is actually like make maybe version two or three in terms of just continuing to upgrade it. Because again, if you're going to put that flag in the sand, um, you you wanted to make it, you want to make it the the very best experience it can be. Where they're like, okay, this is kind of weird, but I can make this work. And you know, I I would you know we had our volunteers at the church, but I would hire in some you know, kind of pro people here in the Oklahoma City area. And all of them are like, yeah, I can make this work. It's maybe not my favorite situation, but I mean, I kept calling them. They kept coming back. So they didn't tell me no. Everything in this rig is stuff that's like, that's go-to gear. So I wouldn't have too much to complain with. Great sounding amp for sure. Now you might notice this amp that is over here. Uh, this is also a Vox amp, but this is, um, it's actually got uh, two speakers in it and it is solid state. Uh, we use this purely for backup. So this is um, for those situations where 10 minutes before service, you blow a tube or something just doesn't sound right. Uh, we can very quickly take this cable and plug it into here and with minimal fuss, still be able to carry on the service. Now, uh, this is not an amp that we necessarily picked out. This just happened to be something that we found backstage in our student area. It's probably not one that I would have picked for myself, but something is better than nothing. Wow, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're at a church. I said this in my last video. A lot of times at churches, you know, our expectations are high, but budgets are low. And the fact that they even have an extra amp if something goes wrong is pretty cool, even if it's not the amp that you would want. I mean, obviously, you'd probably want the same exact amp or some other backup, but the fact that there is a backup and... And we've already done the work to dial in that second amp to be similar to the first. Now, it being solid state and a different, you know, it, it you know, it didn't sound as good as just the natural breaking where it, like that box when it starts to break up. Like it, it didn't sound as awesome, but we did spend some time, have one of our guys come in and say, okay, make this amp sound like this amp um, so that we were prepared if a tube blew, which happened once. I mean, obviously you'd probably want the same exact amp or some other backup, but the fact that there is a backup and something you show up and something goes wrong and you just can't play anymore, they've got it taken care of. Good job, Dave, good job. Thanks. Um, I'm a big believer in redundancy and because if it, if it can fail, it will fail. I mean, he's on top of it. He's been around the block. He knows what's going on. He's exactly right. Like, cause I've seen it, I've seen it. And so, and I'm also a one on the Enneagram, which also maybe explains all the control issues, I guess, I don't know. But I have seen things fail. Um, I've literally seen uh, speaker cones catch on fire because of impedance mismatch between the amp and the speakers. So yeah, I do like to be prepared as much as possible. And yeah, we couldn't afford another amp that's the same, but it, it was better than nothing. And um, I happened to see a deal on a sparkle drive one day. Someone was selling it for like 60 bucks or something like that. I was like, I will buy that. And I will put that in the back. In the case that our sparkle drive on the main board goes out, I got another one. So as, as much as you can be, be redundant, the, the better, I think. Like the fact that they put this much thought into it, I could definitely serve at this church. Even if I had to adjust my thoughts around like not bringing in my own gear, the fact that he is taking care of the volunteers, that is something that is very important to me. That's one of my New Year's resolutions That's a goal. For, for this year to take care of my volunteers even more than I have been doing. I think you value your volunteers. Eh, I can't talk. If you value your volunteers, um, you just have a way better team experience. They show up, they're ready to yeah. worship. I think, I think this is great. Now we do allow our electric guitar players to play their own guitars. For oh, thank you, Dave. Finally, they have some of their own choice. They get to bring their own guitar. <laughs> I'm just being funny, but. But are you, but are you, I feel like you're holding back just a little bit. And I'm just saying this because we're friends and I, I just want people, like, I want the third chair to know that like we're friends. This is, this is totally fine. If you did a reaction to my reaction, like it, it may be like, here's the things I wanted to say, but I didn't say, cause I didn't know like how, like, I would be curious to watch. I think we all would. Um, but I don't have a church guitar yet. I mean, it would be a goal of mine to have one as a backup, but um, usually people have their own guitar. 
Let's see what he says. He said he's about to say for two reasons, I think. Two reasons. One, that's a pretty intimate relationship between a person and their electric guitar. Just It is, but I would say it's just as intimate for a lot of people and their pedals. I'm learning this. I'm, I, I can change. I'm learning this. <laughs> was number two. Can I, can I back that up? That was funny. But I would say it's just as intimate for a lot of people and their pedals. I mean... <laughs> All right, was number two. Naturally knowing where frets are and things like that. So we understand that. But also too, uh, some sets and some songs call for different guitars. For example, a song might call for a Strat if you're playing like real chinky 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 up here. Chinky 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 needs the Strat. Uh, other songs might call for a PRS, something that's a little bit more meaty. And so uh, we've been known to switch out guitars based on sets and sometimes even songs. Uh, but we did want to have a guitar that was church owned for those cases where you've got uh, someone in the youth group that has a hundred dollar guitar, really good chops, but a really bad sounding guitar. Mm -hmm. We have something that they can use and play. It's going to have quality sound. Uh, we're going to get good audio out of it and still be able to utilize that person. So um, we have a Fender Telecaster. This is an American Tele. Love and um, I like that it has the different mm -hmm. kinds of pickups here. Um, and you can switch between them. Okay, I'm gonna tell myself. I know that this guitar has two different pickups. It has a single coil and it has a humbucker. And I know that they sound different. And I know, I know that part. I could not point to the single coil and the humbucker if my life depended on it because I'm not a guitar player. I'm a producer, I'm a music producer that knows enough to get the, all the sounds, but notice in the video that I'm not actually pointing to which one's the single coil and which one's the humbucker because I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a real jack of all trades type guitar. We wanted something that if we're gonna have one guitar, how much coverage, how many different styles can we cover with that one guitar? So see, there's, they're still thinking of everything. I love it. Like a church that is having a worship leader who thinks about even the pickups in a church guitar. Like that's awesome. Dave. Uh, if you need something that's kind of bright, bright sounding, um, you got a pickup for that. If you need something that's a little bit more meatier, you have that as well. And it's just a really pretty sounding guitar. I mean, cool. Like it's cool. I think that uh, providing all that stuff, like I said, they thought through a lot of details, backup amp. They thought through every pedal in the signal chain. It may not be the way I would do it, mm -hmm. but they've thought through it all. And that has to count for something. On the other hand, I can kind of see where the hate is coming from. Like someone who spends a lot of time thinking about my tone and showing up ready to do what I'm prepared to do and sound the way I'm going to sound. Um, I understand that as well, but I'm also a worship leader and I've had people show up with gear that just didn't work. And I was like, man, we wasted a lot of time fixing amps and wondering what's wrong and be like, I'm, I'm sorry, bro. We got it. We got to keep going. We, you know, if you can't figure out your stuff, that's, that's part of being on the worship team is having, I actually put that in my audition form is having gear that is up kept and is sure ooh, to work. Ooh, so, that was a good idea. Actually having that, like setting, cause I'm, I'm huge on you. You need to set the expectation. What is it like to serve on the team? Like, and so I have documentation that says that, you know, we want you to be at rehearsal. We want you to be prepared. We want you to have learned the material that you're not learning it at rehearsal. And I think it's super important to set that expectation at the front, at the onset, uh, especially when they're like excited and they join the team and all that. So that when you have to have the hard conversations, you can kind of, you can, you know, it's like, hey, you already know this. So the fact that he put that in his, in his document, I'm, I'm stealing that. That's a really good idea. So I really, as a leader, understand being able to provide something like that. The difference between the way I would do it and the way Dave is doing it is that they don't have the option it doesn't sound like. Like you come in, you're playing this rig. And so I wonder how you feel. Let me know down in the comments. You know how they feel. I'm still on the line, but I, I would not. There were several comments that say, I wouldn't be able to serve this church or yuck or whatever. Like. I've been a volunteer. I'm on staff, but I've been a volunteer for years. And I would definitely, seeing the effort they put in, seeing the heart behind Dave as a leader to provide a really good experience, I could definitely serve there for sure. I would say check your heart if you can't serve there. But Ooh. that's just my opinion. You may have yours. Let Pulling me out the John Chris. If you like this video, let me know by hitting that thumbs up. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel. Like I said, a lot of people just, they don't subscribe. You should, you should subscribe. subscribe to the channel. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any new content. Thank you guys for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Like I said, that was four years ago and, I, and I'm at a new church. And one of the cool things about being in a new church is you get a chance to kind of reinvent 
yourself, reinvent processes. We, you know, part of the reason why we started what we did at that previous church is that my first couple of players, none of them had any gear. And so we spent the money to have the gear. And then as we kind of moved in this direction and also seeing what I was seeing at Church on the Move and some other churches that were providing the back line saying, this is what you play. I was like, well, that seems reasonable. I, I, I see the benefits of that. Again, as a leader, as a music producer and things like that. Of course, a video like this comes out. I see the comments and things like that. But I also, you know, there were some people that would come and play for me that being on the team and the forethought that went into it and hopefully people enjoying the experience being part of the team maybe outweighed the fact that they had to play this gear. Like, you know, they had to check the pros and the cons and they decided to keep going. But when, uh, you know, so it was one of those things where we just kind of got started. That train kind of left the station this direction. And once you're kind of there, let's say you can't change, but... It's a little bit different. When you we started a brand new church, it's a whole new situation, different people. Uh, there's a lot going on. And the guitar player that, the main guitar player that I had that was there, that was already part of the team, was a really good player, already had his gear, definitely had, you know, like a lot of guitar players, kind of had opinions, had actually heard of me being at this other church and and uh, and kind of the, the, what I had set up. And he's like, yeah, I don't know if I'd do that. And so I was like, okay, not, 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 I'm not, I, this is not the time to put that flag in the sand. My current church, um, our players play their own gear. And because there is a pretty small roster of people coming in and I can, I, I trust their, their, their input and things like that. The consistency still stays and, and, and it's good. There is a Dr. Z amp that's in the back that someone can use that our, one of our main players does use. Uh, quite a bit, but if you want to pull in a different amp or some people bring in modelers like a Kemper or something like that, um, we are a little bit more open. And then obviously you have presets on your soundboard where if Kevin comes into play, you pull up that one. If you, you know, if Brock comes into play, then you pull that other one. It gets you a little bit, a little bit closer. Again, you got to figure out your priorities and what kind of works best for your situation and, and all that. But anyway, Jimmy, this was a lot of fun. And if you haven't heard of Hey Worship Leader or Jimmy Cooper, um, I love what he's doing, and I love that there are people like Jimmy and others that are jumping onto YouTube that are providing resources for worship leaders. Uh, I think it's amazing, you know, and there needs to be more of us. So, Jimmy, 